The story kicks off with a rather steamy moment, but it all comes falling apart for our hero, who wakes up to realize this was just a dream. He isn't too surprised by this because he has lived all his life as a loser boy, but then he panics upon realizing that he has overslept. At first, he believes that he might be late for work, but then it hits him that he has actually taken two days off, so he's in the clear. Now we learn that his name is Yama Zanjiro, who is just like any other man earning a monthly salary. He has been working in a shady company that is known to force its workers to work for over 150 hours a month, and that too on overtime. It's been a while since Yama has had two days on the go without having to do any work, so he feels very relaxed. He considers watching all of the DVDs that have been piling up at his place, but then he figures that he could be making much better use of his time. For example, he could take a trip to some place far away where he has never been before. However, he chooses not to go ahead with that plan, because if he was such a decisive boy, then he wouldn't have such a hard time choosing what to do in the first place. Our hero laughs about this for a while, but then he rides his cycle from the real world into some kind of fantasy dungeon. In front of him is a cute and curvy girl who has a couple of guards standing right next to her. This confuses our hero, especially when the girl addresses him as her groom. Yama has no idea what's going on, so he tries to stay calm while being in front of such a pretty girl. It's easy for him to let his intrusive thoughts run wild, but then he figures that he should focus on analyzing the situation first and then thinking on what kind of decision to make based on the information at hand. The first thing he does is check his lunch, which is still warm, meaning that he is not in a dream. However, the babe in front of him is the same one he was doing unspeakable things with in his fantasy dream earlier today. This is very confusing for Yama, so he has no other option but to choose a safe way out. He bows down to the pretty lady and tells her sorry for intruding into her space. This is typical for an average salary man to do, so Yama hopes he can get out of trouble now. With that, he tries to exit the scene, but only finds a whole bunch of knights blocking his way. Yama panics as these guards come closer and even point their weapons at him, as if to say that he is now a prisoner over here. These are not fake spears either, so Yama starts to think that he's gotten himself into a huge mess. Luckily for him, the pretty lady orders the knights to lower their weapons, and they do so without any kind of hesitation at all. Now to everyone's surprise, the curvy babe bows down to our hero and says sorry for bringing him here without his consent. It is understandable that he is at a loss after seeing what's going on over here, so she explains that he is in a fantasy world, and this is her palace. Yama still doesn't know how this is going to help his situation, so he just nods along for now. The girl says that since he would like to know more about this world and understand why he has been brought here, it would be better for her to take him to some other place where she can explain how this whole thing has come about. Now Yama is taken around the palace, and he is shocked to see how big and impressive it is. He is unable to believe that such a place even exists, especially because his own apartment is nowhere near this mansion. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even feel like he is in Japan anymore. Now that she has given him a tour, the pretty lady makes an introduction and reveals her name to be Ora Capua. She would very much like for Yama to call her Ora, and then our hero also gives her his full name. Since she would like to be friendly with Yama, she asks if she can refer to him as Zinjiro Dono, which he doesn't seem to have a problem with. Now, Ora goes on to tell Yama about the chain of events that have led him to this situation. She warns him that he may get upset over what she says, and may even consider her reckless for doing this. But he does have a choice. If he does not like how things are over here, then she will simply return him to his normal world, where he can continue living the loser life he has always known. It will be as if such a thing never even happened in the first place. Aura swears her honor on this, so Yama decides to hear her out for now. It's not like there's much he can do about this anyway, so he decides to treat this like a customer complaint, so that he can get each and every point that Aura is about to say. She kicks things off by telling Yama that he is in the continent of Rando Rion, 
which is also known as the Southern Continent. The name of this kingdom happens to be Capua, and Aura's palace is right in the middle of the imperial capital city. Yama follows along, but he has never heard of such a place in his life. This is when Aura tells him that it's fine for him to feel this way, because this is what he would call another world in his lingo. Yama takes a moment to register this, because it does sound a bit ridiculous. He gives Aura a very sarcastic look, and then he even starts laughing because he does not believe what she has just told him. He even asks her not to make fun of him, so Aura decides to try another way. She asks him to come closer to her, so he does as she says, but then a monster shows up right in front of him out of the blue. The monster even looks at our hero with spite in its eyes, so Yama panics upon seeing such a deadly beast. He falls to the floor and asks Aura what this is, so she laughs and explains that it is a land dragon. The knights of her land are known to ride such beasts for transport, so she apologizes for scaring Yama. Now, Aura asks him if he has land dragons in his own world, and he obviously says no. This brings him to the realization that he has actually been summoned in another world. Now, both Aura and Yama sit down with each other, and the pretty lady explains to him what this whole world is all about. Their chat goes on for a very long time, so she asks him if he was able to grasp whatever she was trying to explain. Yama says that he did get the gist of it, and states in a summary that he is in the Capua Kingdom, which is located in another world. On top of that, he was summoned here by Aura, who is not only the queen of this world, but also used time and space magic to summon him here. This is apparently a form of magic that only someone from the royal family can use, and Aura is glad to see that Yama was able to get whatever she was telling him. She thanks our hero for confirming her words, and then goes on to enjoy a drink. Yama only looks on in awkward confusion, as Aura tells him to refer to her by her first name, as he is not a subject of her kingdom. He seems to be fine with all of this, but what he doesn't get is why she ended up choosing him out of all the other people out there. He says that he has not ever used magic. Neither has he ever even been able to lift a sword. Keeping this in mind, it doesn't seem likely that he will be of any use to her because she would need a powerful man to handle her. The queen takes a moment and then she tells Yama that she only has one request from him and that is to become her groom. Yama's jaw drops because he doesn't think he heard her correctly. Aura repeats herself again by saying that she would like to make Yama her groom so that he may eventually become her husband. In essence, she wants him to marry her, and this is all it takes for our hero to be astounded by her demands. He drops his drink out of shock and looks at Aura with disbelief. He wants to know why she would want to marry someone like him, so she decides to give him an explanation. Things may look nice and calm right now, but that was not the case some time ago. As a matter of fact, we learn that Aura's kingdom was in a state of war for a very long time before Yama came along. Even thought they were able to win this war, it came at a great price which involved the lives of the royal family. As of now, Aura is the only surviving member of this family, as all of the direct descendants have passed away due to the war. Marriage is a duty at this point to Aura, so it's not like she can avoid at any cost. However, since her royal family is known to have the power of space-time magic running through their veins, Aura can't just marry anyone out there. She has to make sure that this magic is passed on to her children. So the best option would be to marry someone who comes from the same royal bloodline. Hearing this only makes Yama doubt the process even more because he is from Earth. So he does not have any connection to Aura's bloodline. If he does not know how to use magic, then he is the worst possible choice for Aura to try and continue her royal heritage. The queen was expecting to hear something along those lines, so she asks Yama to allow her some more time to explain a story from the past. Now we see her narrating a tale from five generations ago, which can also be interpreted as 150 years ago. During this time, Aura's kingdom had a crown prince who ended up falling in love with a woman whom he could never be with. While some had believed that this girl was a commoner, others had said that she was of royal blood, but from an opposition kingdom. No one could say for sure where this girl came from, 
But the point of the matter was that the prince was madly in love with her, and he did not even care about his position as the next king of the land. He was only bothered by the fact that he could not be with the girl of his dreams. Since they could not be together in this world, they instead decided to be together in another world. This seems very romantic to Aura, but Yama wants to know why she is telling him so much about her kingdom. That's when she explains that our hero is the descendant from this exact same couple. The summoning spell that Aura had used would only choose a man who had strong ties to her royal bloodline. And in this case, it happened to be Yama. Since our hero has appeared in front of Aura, there is no doubt that he is the one who has descended from her kingdom's prince. As the queen looks into Yama's eyes with desire in her heart, he realizes that she might be making sense after all. After all, his deceased parents, and even his relatives back at home seemed to match Aura's look. They all had darker skin when compared to normal Japanese people, but even if such a thing were to be true, he is five generations into the future. This could mean that he barely has any royal blood left inside him right now. Aura does admit that she was expecting such a thing to happen, but as per her calculations, it looks like Yama has a very strong match percentage with her royal family. Of course our hero is not as strong as a direct descendant, but even then, he has an amazing amount of mana inside his body. As a matter of fact, he has enough power inside him to make him the head of a branch family. If he puts in the right amount of training, Yama could even be able to use space-time magic himself. So, keeping everything in mind, it looks like our hero has turned out to be the perfect man for the job. Now, Aura admits that she may have surprised way too many times for his own liking, so she would like to sit down with him and talk things out in a calmer manner. The queen presents Yama with the option to go back to his world if he does not wish to stay inside this fantasy world. After all, she was the one who summoned him here without his consent so she will make sure to send him back and make it seem as if it never happened in the first place. She tells Yama to be at ease because he seems to be very worried about the fact that he won't ever be able to go back home. Now that this is out of the way, Aura says that she will still send Yama back once to his original world, even if he chooses to marry her. Basically, the act of summoning a person and sending them back to their real world is something that depends on the stars above in the sky. Aura is not able to use this magic as freely as she would like. But as of now, the alignment of the stars is going to remain the same until the next night. After that, it will return again in a month, so Aura can only make use of the window she has right now. The main problem is that if she misses the next alignment, then the one coming after that will only occur in 30 years. This is a huge shock for Yama, because 30 years is a lot of time for someone his age. He would like to confirm everything that he has just heard, so he tells Aura that no matter what he says, she will send him back to his original world the next night. If he says yes, then she will summon him again within one month, but if she misses that mark, when our hero will have to wait for another thirty years. This causes Aura to take a pause because she knows that such a decision will affect the course of their very lives. The queen flaunts her curvy body and asks Yama, if he would not seriously consider marrying her and living in this world. This puts our hero into a train of thought because even if he says yes, then that means he will have to say goodbye to Japan for 30 years. However, if Aura is telling him the truth, then it's not a bad deal out for Yama because he is pretty much the definition of a loser boy. Not only is he a loner, he also does not have any family or girlfriend to go back to. There's also the fact that he's working for a shady company back on Earth, and the only thing that works in his favor is that he gets paid for his overtime work. Even if he were to leave that company, he would not be missing out on much, so it should be an easy decision for Yama. Now that he thinks about it, he will not have any regrets about leaving Earth, because he has nothing to live for over there. In this fantasy world though, he will get to marry a pretty wife with an amazing body who also happens to be the queen of this kingdom. It's like a dream come true for any young boy, because he will have the perfect wife while also living the life of a royal king. Such ideas awaken his intrusive thoughts, as our hero continues to fixate on Aura's twin peaks. 
which are indeed worthy of admiration. However, his laughter is cut short when he seems to have some kind of realization. Yama figures that if he is going to become a royal member of the kingdom, then he will have tons of work to do. After all, people in high positions don't really have much free time on their hands. He will probably need to attend ceremonies from time to time. He would also need to make greetings. And most importantly, he would be required to maintain healthy relations with the neighboring countries. This is a highly political job, so our hero wonders if he is really cut out to be a king. Since he does not want to take any risks, he decides to ask Aura about what his job role is going to be over here. To his shock and surprise, Aura says that he will not need to do anything at all. Aura explains that the reason for this is because he will be the very first husband of the Queen of Capua. Her kingdom has always been dominated by men, so the fact that she is a ruling figure over here is an instance that probably will only happen once in a lifetime. Women are not really given much authority in this land, as their main job is to serve their men and look after the household. In the case of Aura, there has never been any kind of law regarding the roles of a husband to the queen. This means that Yama is not needed to perform any kind of duties at all, which sounds like a sweet deal. On top of that, Aura tells him not to worry about his role in this world, because her job will be to satisfy all his desires, no matter what shape or form that they may take. This sounds a bit too good to be true, because nobody would ever have such amazing luck come their way. No matter how Yama thinks about it, he feels that there has to be something else to the offer that's being presented to him. He tries to figure what Aura is going to get out of this deal, and the only thing that comes to mind is his royal blood. After all, she's basically telling him that he can live like a lazy goose, which is not what a normal woman would want in a man. Maybe Aura likes men who don't do anything with their lives, but would she really give our hero so much in his favor just to have him as her husband? This is when Yama awakens the businessman inside of him and states that he can't close a deal based off such little information. After all, he might just get the rug pulled out from under him, so he would like to ask the queen a few more questions. Yama reminds himself to think like a salary man because in business, a man's look is determined by his will. He wants to strike the best kind of deal there is, and since Aura doesn't have a problem with his questions, he decides to give his interrogation skills a shot. First, he asks her how she would go about her marriage if he were to turn down her proposal. Aura replies by saying she would simply marry a noble man who has strong blood ties to her royal family. Yama realizes that there are other marriage candidates apart from him. But in that case, he needs to know how this noble man is connected to Aura's family. His questions seem to amuse the queen, so she takes a deep breath and says that there is no one in this kingdom who has blood ties to her royal family that can even rival Yama. The best possible case that she can expect will be her grandfather's mother's descendants and nothing more than that. Yama believes that he has caught on to something here, so he tries to use his brain. A grandfather's mother would be four generations before Aura, so if the ancestry line fostered any further children, then there would not have been a need to summon Yama, who if from five generations ago. Aura had also stated that his ancestry line was a pleasant miscalculation, so this could mean that the strength of his blood ties to Aura's family don't really mean much. Yama now starts to wonder if there is value in the fact that he is from another world. There is so much going on in our hero's head that he starts to imagine everything being a big fat lie. Suddenly, Yama comes back to his senses and reminds himself not to get too carried away. Otherwise his caution will not be of any use. After all, if a queen like Aura really had any shady motives, then she would not have revealed that she could send him back to his world, even if he said no. A villain would probably make up an excuse for not being able to undo their summoning. After considering all the angles, our hero is sure that Aura actually wants him to consider marrying her. Yama doesn't want to play any more games, so he asks Aura straight up that if he does marry her, then would he not need to do any kind of work in the kingdom. This is when he suspects that Aura actually wants a man who will not bother her with the ruling of her kingdom. The queen simply says that she can't expect our hero to do anything for her, 
if she has made him forsake his past life and his memories for this new position. This is enough information for Yama, so he decides to go over the points once again for clarity. First, there's the point that there are noble men waiting in line to marry Aura. But even then, she decided to summon a boy who was not supposed to have ties even as strong as these men. However, after Yama came to her world, she realized that he actually has the best connection to her family in this world. This explains the miscalculation, but even then, it looks like the only thing that Aura wants from Yama is children. Since the very existence of a queen has never been heard of in this part of the world, Yama finds himself in a unique position to be the very first prince consort the kingdom has ever seen. Keeping these things in mind, our hero can very clearly see the goal that has been put right in front of him. He still has a few more questions left to clarify, so he continues by asking where exactly would he be staying in this country. Aura answers by saying it will most likely be the inner palace where both our hero and the queen will be living with each other, although at irregular intervals. Everything seems to be on track. So then Yama asks his final question to Aura. He wants to know that if he were to say yes to marrying Aura, then would it be fine for him to just stay confined within the inner palace? He would not speak or interact with anyone apart from Aura because he needs to fulfill his duties as a husband. Basically, our hero just wants to laze around and have fun each and every day. To his pleasant surprise, Aura gives him a smile and says that she would be more than happy to welcome that kind of attitude. This is all our hero needs to hear to realize that he has indeed hit the jackpot with Aura. The queen does not want him to do anything at all, apart from being a husband, and he fits the bill perfectly. If a noble man were to marry Aura, then he would also want to use the power that she holds as the queen. This would lead to power struggles and an ugly mess whenever they would get into an argument. In such a case, it would give rise to a dual power structure, and the kingdom would get split up into separate factions. Keeping this in mind, it would make sense to summon a person like Yama, since he is from another world, and hence, has no connection to Aura's family from the outset. Now the queen tells our hero that while this may be a very big decision, and she doesn't want to rush him through it, Yama should try to take a call by the next night, because that's the only window she has to send him back to his own world. Our hero once again sits down to put his life into perspective, but he comes back with the same response. At the end of the day, he is a salary man, so this is the best kind of deal anyone can offer him. This is his one and only chance to actually enjoy his life, rather than doing so much work just to get by. He had to bow his head down to his bosses, even when he didn't want to. And even though he had become a full member of society in itself, there's only so much that basic status can do for you. However, at the same time, our hero believes that he does have pride in the fact that he was able to do all of this on his own, so he needs to consider something even greater. It is the fact that he will have to be kept by a woman, which is not a proud thing for a man. He can't just let go of such a thing easily. Seeing him in such deep thought does make Aura a bit conscious, and we can even see tears in her eyes. She says that even as she is thinking about it, she is asking too much from our hero. First of all, she summoned him here without his permission, and now she is asking him to rush through an important decision. It's almost as if she has become the very definition of what a tyrant is supposed to be. Now, she would not be surprised if Yama refused her proposal, and then she even asks him to forgive her for making him have this chat with her. She did not mean to come across as a shady woman and enforce her wishes upon Yama. This is all it takes for our hero to be smitten by her, and he gets up from his seat to hold the queen's hand. Now, Yama openly tells Aura that they should get married and this shocks her more than anyone else. Basically, he got the look from her that confirmed her true intentions, so now he does not have any issues with being taken care of by Aura. He tells the queen that he accepts her proposal, and this makes her blush. Now, we move on to meet the queen's right-hand man, known as Fadio, who greets Aura with respect. He then asks her that since she is now engaged to Yama, what would her impressions be as of now? She goes on to say that he is a lot sharper than she had expected him to be, and he might have already figured out what her true intentions are. 
Now, another man walks in and says that if Aura is skeptical of Yama, then she can just go ahead and accept the marriage proposal of one of her relatives. After all, it would not be surprising if Yama had his own motives as well. This man is the head of the court wizards, named Asperidian, also known as Asprit. Aura asks him that he may believe such a thing, but would he rather have her marry men like the hungry wolf or the puppet who are after her? The hungry wolf is known as Lord Pujaru, who is from the Jijin family. Asprit believes that he would make for a good husband because he is a great commander and one of the best warriors in the kingdom. On the other hand, there is also the puppet, who is named Lord Raphael of the Marquis family. His skills are good enough for him to become a highly valuable civil servant. Despite what the Lord of the Wizards may say, Aura simply replies by mocking both the lords. Pujaru is a man who just has too much ambition, while Raphael is nothing more than a puppy who will listen to whatever his family tells him. Fadio realizes that the queen is not going to move away from her decision, but he still mentions that Yama is not just from another class, but also from another world. From whatever he has seen so far, he is not so sure if Aura will be able to raise a family with our hero. The queen simply says that when it comes to such matters, it will depend on how persistent she will be with him. The men go along with what she says, but they also mention that it will be a huge problem if the royal family does not produce a child. The possibility is rare, but if it were to happen that Yama's elephant fails to rise for Aura's black hole, then this will have to be reported to the council instantly. Aura simply laughs this off, because she feels that having children will be the least of their concerns. Fadio would like to know what she means by this, so she explains that Yama could not take his eyes off her twin peaks the entire time they were having their chat. Basically, our hero's intrusive thoughts got the better of him, and even though he tried his best to steal glances of Aura's curvy body, she was able to see through all of them. So, she is sure that her body will ensure that the two of them will end up having a child. Now, we move back to the real world where Yama has a month to wrap things up. The first thing he does is quit his job, which comes as quite a surprise to his boss. The reason he enlists is that he is taking over the family business, so his boss tries to sway him with his words. He states that Yama had just started becoming a major asset to the company, so he wouldn't have taken such a job if he had hated it. Of course, our hero knows that his boss wouldn't believe him if he said that he was leaving to get married to the queen of another world, so he simply says that he's had a change of heart. The boss accepts his resignation but he also expects Yama to complete his notice period at the company. Until then, he will look for a new hire, so our hero bows down once again and agrees to the terms. Now that he's gotten this out of the way, Yama realizes that there isn't much time left for his summoning session. He needs to get ready before Aura calls for him again, so he decides to do the things that a husband would normally do for his wife. This includes going wedding shopping and he even picks up a ring for the queen to make it feel like a proper marriage. The next thing he does is look for a power source, because he had quite a hard time back in her palace. It was so hot that he couldn't really sleep in peace, and he literally thought that it was 100 degrees, even though he didn't have a thermometer. Since he is now going to live in the kingdom for at least 30 years, he would love to have a fridge and an air conditioner as well. If he's going to be stuck in a room for the most of his time there, then he's also going to need entertainment in the form of games and movies. For that, he will need a generator, so he checks out what all he can buy from here. Yama comes across a whole bunch of options, but then he figures that he needs to come up with a power source. After all, diesel and gasoline would not be the right choice as getting fuel in the kingdom would be a bit of an issue. Wind energy is not too reliable. And since our hero will need electricity at night, solar power would also not be an efficient method. There are generators that work on batteries too, but there's only a certain amount of batteries that a man can buy. After considering everything in front of him, Yama realizes that the best option for him is a hydro generator. As he prepares for his new life, a month goes by rather quickly, but a lot of it went into getting the legal papers signed for his hydro generator. He could have tried to force the people to sell it to him, 
but they would have probably just refused his order if he did not sign the River Law's paperwork. With that hassle completed, Yama makes sure to have the moving company make a video on how to assemble the generator. This would make it easy for him to take it down and put it back up when he travels to Aura's world. As his luck would have it, he even has a place where he can practice setting up the generator. It's a mountain lodge that was set far away from the village where he was born. Most of the area was under the name of his grandparents when he had left for Tokyo. But Yama can enjoy the lodge and the area around it, as they were both put under his name. It's actually the best possible place for him to try such things out, and he gets a hang of the generator soon enough. He's also got batteries just in case, and even in a worst-case scenario, the generator will last for 10 years. After all, there's only so much of a warrant you can expect from such an item, and most importantly, this is just a tool to help Yama get used to the world around him. It would be great if our hero got used to living in Capua before the generator breaks down, but he's also made such a big decision on a whim, so he'll just have to hope for the best. There's no turning back for now, so he has to arrange all his equipment together. He also gets a cart so that the process becomes easy for him, but it's still quite the task. Yama falls to the floor after moving everything, and even admits that he had though he was going to meet his maker. He is an amateur after all, so moving all these items would have been a pain for him. Anyway, all the preparations are done now, so the only thing that's left is for the moving company to take all of Yama's other electronics to the warehouse. Now we learn that Yama was given a magic carpet by Aura when he was sent back to Japan. Basically, this is filled with time-space magic so he will need to place all the items he wishes to get with him on top of the carpet for them to also travel with him. Now, Yama thinks about all the work he's done during this month to make sure he's ready for Aura and her world. He's even bought rings as a mark of respect to their marriage, so all that's left is for him to say goodbye to Earth. All he has ever done here is work, and with no family or dreams to motivate him, he is not going to have any regrets at all. Before he leaves, he decides to visit his relatives and is greeted by them with cheers and smiles. They are surprised to see him here because it's been a while since they last met and now he's telling them that he's going abroad. The group discusses how tough it is for someone to settle overseas because it will be a completely different world from Japan and there will be barriers such as language. Seeing them speak makes our hero remember his earlier days as his relatives have not changed at all. We learned that when Yama was in middle school, he lost his parents to a car accident. He would eventually move to a high school dorm, but before that, he had stayed in this very house for a year and a half. Despite it only being such a short period of time, the family has still kept his seat at the table. Yama is told to enjoy the taste of home because he won't be coming back for a hole now. He enjoys his meal and thanks his relatives for their love and support. They even tell him that he can always reach out to them if he is facing any problems abroad. He happily accepts their gesture and thinks to himself that even though he had expected this to happen, he still feels a bit sad about leaving them. They did take good care of him which was why he ended up meeting them one last time before he left this world. He takes a look at all the items in his room and sees an old cassette player, along with a study desk and a wardrobe. It's almost as if he had never left, because his room is still how it was when he used to stay here. Yama actually feels really bad, because even though his relatives have treated him like their own family, he has not given anything back to them. He tries to sleep now, but starts feeling cold, so he gets upset with himself. He talks to himself and tries to motivate his body because he's prepared for this exact reason. Suddenly, he hears knocking at the door, so he opens it to see his Oba-san standing in front of him. He asks her what she's doing over here at such a late time of night, so she asks him if there is something that he's hiding from her. It seemed as if he was hiding something from the family at the dinner table so she wants to know if all is well. Our hero takes a moment, and then he tells her that he was probably just a bit nervous about going abroad and settling down over there. He says sorry if he made himself seem odd at the dinner table, 
but his Oba San tells him not to worry about her or the others as they are all family. She goes on to give him a touching speech about how family will always worry about one another, but that should not weaken his resolve because he needs to live his best life. She says that she will always support Yama, no matter what, and this makes our hero emotional. He suddenly drops the wedding rings that he had got for himself and Aura, so he panics and rushes to take them before his Oba-san sees them. She asks if he's alright. But then Yama speaks in an excited voice, thanking her for all that she's done for him. He also mentions that he may not see her for a while, but he will do his best. She is a bit surprised to see Yama like this, so he says sorry for speaking in such a high volume. However, his Obasan smiles and says that he had a look on his face that she had not seen in a while. He wants to know what kind of look this is. So she explains that it's the same kind of look that he had when her husband had asked to marry her. Our hero feels like she has seen right through him. But anyway, he gets ready for his journey and thanks his relatives for all their support. Now, he takes a small blade and pricks the top of his finger so that some blood can come out for the time-space magic to work. Aura had told him that since he has magic inside him, he will be able to activate the magic in the carpet given to him as well. This will allow Aura to summon him and all the other items he's bringing with him to the other world. Suddenly, the magic in the carpet gets activated, and then our hero gets a glimpse of his life on Earth. He sees how he had first found out that he was alone when his parents passed away, so he gives credit to his relatives for helping him get back on his feet. He then looks at the time he got accepted into college, which was a great moment for him because all his hard work had paid off at the time. Even if he looks back at his time working for the shady company, he admits that he learned quite a few things while he was there. There were good times and bad times, but either way, our hero thanks Earth for his life, and now he is ready to welcome another world. A burst of light takes over, and our hero is blinded for a moment. But then he can hear Aura telling him that she's glad to see he's here. Now she can truly say that Yama is in her kingdom inside her world. Yama looks up and sees his wife in waiting who welcomes him as her life partner. With that, our hero takes a deep breath and declares that he is back for good. Of course, the queen has to be careful, so she has her men inspect all of the items that Yama has brought with him. She also tells them that if they find anything shady, then they should bring it to her without any hesitation. One of the men ends up finding a lot of bottles and he tells Aura that they are all alcohol containers. Some of these bottles had broken due to the movement caused during the summoning transfer, and the smell coming from them is most definitely that of alcohol. The queen takes a look at these bottles, and then tells her men to store all the ones with alcohol inside the wine cellar. Now she notices a glass shard inside one of the boxes, which has probably come from a broken bottle. Aura picks it up and is amazed to see how humans have also been able to create crystals of their own due to the shiny nature of the glass shard. She wonders if vessels such as these are common in Yama's world, but the thing is that he has brought so many items from Earth that all of them seem to fascinate Aura. As the palace men take a look at all the different things that he has brought with him, it becomes clear to the queen that there is a marked difference between her and Yama. All these devices in his boxes state that he comes from a culture which the people of Capua have never even heard of. Suddenly, she sees one of her men doing something shady next to a box, so she stops him right in his tracks. She wants to know what he is hiding, so the other men also gather around to see what's up. The man says that he would never do anything shady in front of his queen, but she tells him to show what he had just put away because it looks like cloth. Judging from the man's movement, Aura wonders if he has just placed poison into her husband's luggage. With no other choice, the man reveals a rather spicy set of clothes that Yama may have brought in anticipation of getting with Aura on their first night together. Everyone notices that this is an outfit for women, especially because of how thin and transparent the cloth is. But they wonder why a boy like Yama has brought such clothes along with him. Now that the man is in the clear, Aura says sorry to him for her suspicions, but everyone thinks it's rather shady for Yama to have such an item in his luggage. However, 
Aura seems to be fine with our hero's intrusive thoughts, because he is a man after all. Now we move to our hero who is sitting by himself and also feeling a bit nervous. He shouldn't have brought anything dangerous with him. But the items from Earth may seem shady to the people from this world. Yama wonders if everything is going to be fine, and then he hears knocking on the door. He allows the person to come in, and her name is revealed to be Amanda, who is the head maid of this palace. As part of her job, she oversees all the slaves of the inner section, so she asks our hero if he has some time for her to introduce all the maids of the palace to him. Yama doesn't have any problem with this because it's not like he can leave his room right now either. Plus, he's not going to be a busy man as Aura's husband, so he can take his time with these maids. Now the maid girls walk in one after the other, and our hero is shocked to see the number of people simply in this section. They kick things off with Anise, who is in charge of cleaning, then Vanessa who works in the kitchen, followed by Amelia who tends to the gardens, and Araja who tends to the baths. These four maid girls are the main ones who look after various areas of the inner palace. If Yama is ever to be in trouble and needs help, then he can feel free to call upon one of these girls. Our hero can only nod his head and say yes for now, but the head maid seems to share a glance with him that isn't normal. She soon recollects herself and bows down to Yama, but even he felt what just happened. He wonders if he is being too polite to these maid girls, because Capua definitely looks like something from an ancient era. After all, it may be that staff members are not treated with a lot of respect here in the palace. Our hero feels that it would be best if he thought of himself as a higher rank when compared to the others. However, it's going to be tough to get used to such a method, so he will probably need to grow into it. As of now, what he should do as the master is go about memorizing the names of all these maid girls. He is barely able to remember Amanda's name. And then the head maid says that there are a total of nine maids, all of whom will be attending to him directly. This is definitely not what Yama had in mind when he came here, because it's like a luxury for him. Now we meet the other girls, starting with Karen who says that Yama should feel free to ask her for whatever he wants. Then we meet Dolores, Fi, Leet, Crystal, Keisha, and Ima, all of whom are here to serve our hero. Amanda tells him that if he ever feels like asking for something minor, then he can talk to these nine girls because he should not feel like he needs to ask Amanda first before going to the others. Yama is okay with this, he guesses, but he also has to remember all the names of these girls which is going to be a pain. He decides to tell them that he is going to be in their care now, but then he realizes that he is being way too polite again, so he straightens his back and says that he expects great work from them all. This odd behavior actually works on the maid girls, so Yama realizes that it's really hard trying to live like a royal. Now he meets with Aura who tells him that there are still some items of his that she would like to know the use for. Other than that, she will try her best to have all his items moved to the palace the next day. She does admit that she took the liberty of storing all his alcohol bottles into the cellar but he doesn't have a problem with that. Of course, he's still feeling a bit uneasy, so Aura asks her husband if there is something that's bothering him. After all, she is here to make sure all his desires are met, so he can tell her whatever he feels. That's when Yama confesses that he's at a loss when it comes to the common sense of this world. He also has no idea on how he should be acting as royalty over here, so Aura asks him for some time to think about it. She will then figure out a way to help her husband adapt to this kingdom and its ways. It is a bit embarrassing for Yama, so he says sorry for the trouble he's causing, but Aura says it's totally understandable for him to be this way. She then says that she and her team had a look at everything he has brought with him, but they came across a lot of items and tools that looked like crystals made by hand. Of course, no one from this kingdom has come across anything like it before so it has made them realize just how different their worlds are. Of course, Yama has no idea what crystals she's talking about, but then he figures that it might be the marbles that he's got with him. He explains to us that when he first came into this world, he didn't really see any glass around, so he thought that it would be nice to bring some of his own. However, 
he can now use his glass items for trading and other such activities. In any case, Aura would prefer if her husband rested for today and relaxed a bit because things are going to get a bit busy tomorrow. He wants to know what's up, so Aura reveals that the preparations for the wedding will begin as the dates have been set for five days from now. As expected, Yama is a bit taken aback by this call because five days is way too soon for any kind of wedding prep. The queen explains that since there is no precedent for this kind of royal wedding, the amount of time that it will take for the actual prep will not be a lot. After all, a wedding for a direct royal descendant, such as Aura would take around a year to prepare. For such families, weddings are not just a simple celebration, but rather an extremely important place for diplomacy as well. Over the period of one year, messages would be sent to each and every possible nobleman and member of royalty, not just from a local angle, but also from a foreign one. Also, since weddings are supposed to showcase how well off a kingdom is, it becomes important to make it as grand as possible. Yama makes sense of the situation, but then he asks Aura if she is having a wedding so soon due to the fact that she is a queen and not a king. She smiles at her future husband and states that he does have an astute sense of deduction. There is no such precedent for a queen to have a wedding in the kingdom, and if anyone had an issue with it, then they would have stopped it from going ahead. Yama adds to this by saying her wedding would end up complicating the structure of power in the kingdom too. Aura gives him an example by saying if she were to sit on the throne as the sole ruler of the kingdom and Yama went ahead to father a child with another woman, then it would make things very complicated. There would be some individuals who would end up plotting against her so that they can make the child become the next king of the land. Of course, Yama says that he would never do something like this, but the queen only wants to make sure that no one messes around with her wedding. She goes on to say that there is not much to worry about, because her political prowess is such that it will not fail against any kind of political scheme. Even so, the best she can do is take the wind out of the sails of those who are plotting against her. She fully intends to place as less of a burden as possible on our hero, but there will be times when she will need him to help out with some stuff. He does not know what she means by this, so it does make him a bit nervous, but he is up to the task so he tells her that he will make himself useful whenever it's possible. Aura tells him once again that the ceremony is going to be small, so she hopes he doesn't have an issue with that. We quickly move forward to the wedding now, where we see lots of people in attendance. The announcer declares that everyone present here will now witness the ceremony between Queen Aura and Yama, who will now be referred to as His Majesty. Our hero on the other hand, is shocked to see the number of people in attendance, because this is by no means a small ceremony. After all, even Hollywood weddings aren't as flamboyant as this one. Our hero looks quite nice having been dressed properly, and even Aura is looking lovely in her white dress. She says it's time to go, but our hero wonders who will take the first step, as there will be lots of judgment to be passed. If Aura makes the first move, then she will be seen as a woman who thinks of herself to be above men. However, if Yama does it, then he will be seen as a shady man who is manipulating the queen. Keeping this in mind, the best way would be to step forward at the same time, and then the couple makes their entry. Some men talk about how the groom is supposed to have a lot of mana, which is probably why Aura will want to have his baby inherit the powers of the royal family. The rumors already begin to spread amongst the people in attendance, but it's mostly got to do with the fact that they want to get close to Yama. This becomes too much for our hero to take, and the anxiety is becoming a bit too much for him to handle. He tries to calm himself down, but it is of no use, and he loses his sense of balance. It even looks like he is going to fall down, but just as this is about to happen, his arm is held by Aura who saves him from a rather humiliating moment. He figures that the queen is used to this kind of chatter, so he should also do his best to make this work out. He reminds himself that this is the moment he has been waiting for, because he is going to live a new life moving forward. He decides to walk forward, and even though it may feel like he is a baby who is just learning to walk, our hero knows that his life is going to change forever with this marriage. 
The both of them walk up to the head of the wizards, and they bow down to him to gain his blessings. With that, the wedding is done with, and everyone cheers for Yama and Aura together. Our hero takes a look at all the common folk in front of him, and he feels a bit overwhelmed by it all. Later at night, he can breathe a sigh of relief as he tells Aura that they managed to make it through all the drama. Now the queen switches to flirt mode and tells Yama that he must be tired from this day, just as she is. He wants to get something for her to drink because it's getting hot in here, and he is already feeling nervous. Our hero goes to the fridge that he's got to this world and takes out a bottle of wine that's chilled. However, he also knows that tonight is his first night with Aura as her husband, so there are some expectations. Intrusive thoughts aren't hard to come by for Yama, but the last time he was with a girl was back in college, so he's a bit rusty to say the least. It doesn't even matter that he and Aura are tired, because it is their duty to do shady things with each other. He gives the queen some wine, but he wonders how he is going to get her in the mood. After all, he has never been with anyone from royalty, so this might get a bit interesting. The funny thing is that he doesn't even need to make any effort, because Aura asks him to come sit next to her instead of on the other side of the couch. This is clearly an invitation to do unspeakable things with each other. But is our hero going to accept? Is he finally going to conquer the queen of his new world? Like share and subscribe if you liked this video. Hit the bell icon to get notified when I upload part 2. See you soon. After our hero Yama finally agrees to marry the queen Aura in another world, he is presented with a tricky situation wherein she invites him to come sit close to her on their wedding night. She is high off some wine, so she has already tapped into her intrusive thoughts. However, Yama does not know how he should react because he has never found himself in such a position before. That too with a girl as pretty as Aura. The queen eases his nerves by saying that they are husband and wife from now on, so there is no need to feel shy about anything. As they are alone, they are bound to get closer to each other. So Yama takes the risk and sits next to his new wife. Things become awkward very quickly as our hero doesn't make a move on Aura, and he just sits there while she continues to sip on her wine. His heart is beating faster than a space rocket, because he feels that he is too close to Aura right now. However, if he pulls away, then she might get the wrong idea and think that he's not interested in her. The silence continues to make things weird, so Aura decides to change the subject. She tells Yama that he has brought some amazing electrical items from his world to this place. She comments on the lighting and cooling power of some of the items, as they seem to remind her of the twin kingdoms Sharova and Jilbel. Yama also realizes that apart from the time he spent on getting ready for his wedding, he was also busy with setting up the power generator to make sure all his gadgets were working properly. Now that everything is in place, he feels that all his hard work did not go to waste. He seems a bit relaxed now, so Aura puts down her glass and takes her husband's name as she gets even closer to him. The queen holds on to our hero's arm, which makes him blush out of nervousness. He decides to change the topic and then asks Aura about Sharova and Jill Bell. After all, he wants to know if there is such a place in this world where he can get items that are usually found on Earth. Aura says yes indeed and goes on to explain how the twin kingdoms work with each other. The Sharova family is good at bestowal magic, while the Jill Bell family is great with healing magic. Both the royal families work together and treat each other as equals which has allowed them to form a large kingdom in the center of the southern continent. It is due to the bestowal magic that they are the only kingdom in the world that can create magic tools. At night, they use magic jewels to light up the town, and they also have wind jewels that allow for cooling when it gets really hot. Yama is impressed that people of this world have magic for such things. But then Aura switches back to romance mode as she pulls his face towards her. Now, the queen says that there has been something which has been bothering her for a while now. Yama asks her what the matter is, but he keeps referring to her as Aura-san. This is exactly the problem as she does not want her husband to keep calling her such a thing. After all, they are not strangers anymore, 
So Yama needs to do something about this bad habit of his. She wants him to act like her husband. But our hero counters that even she refers to him in a similar manner. This is the way Yama has always spoken, so it's not like he is specifically speaking to her in a formal manner. The queen agrees with Yama and admits that they do speak as if they are distant from each other. She then asks our hero if it is fine for her to refer to him by his first name. This takes him by surprise, and he doesn't know how to respond, but he eventually says yes. Aura is happy to hear this, and now she tells him to refer to her by her first name as well. It's s little tough for him to do this, but he does call her by her name, and then the both of them start calling out each other's names for a bit. One thing leads to another, and the newly married couple finally locks lips for the first time. Both parties unleash their intrusive thoughts and Aura is so happy that she hugs Yama for finally showing his shady intentions. Now she teases him by saying she is going to their bedroom chamber as she has a lot to prepare for. She then tells him to slowly count till 100 before entering the room. With that, she walks away and our hero is left feeling a bit confused. She reassures him that he doesn't need to worry as she will not run away. Yama has a blank look on his face, but he is about to get very lucky. Now the queen enters the bedroom chamber and switches on the lights. But to our surprise, she blushes a lot and is shown to be very nervous herself. She says that even though she feels a bit embarrassed by what just happened, the thought of her and Yama engaging in such shady acts every night does get her heart pounding. On top of that, she wonders if Yama had noticed something about her. But since they were so close to each other, it does not seem as if he had seen what Aura did not want him to see. The queen takes off her robe and says that it has been a long time since she has felt such a sensation in her body. It's almost as if she is going for her first ever battle. But in this case, she does not know what she is supposed to do. She starts noticing too many details and even covers the lamp because she thinks it's too bright. Aura takes a moment to collect herself and then her 100 seconds are up as Yama comes knocking on her door. He comes in with a shady look on his face, and it becomes even shadier when he sees his wife lying bare in front of him. Yama's face looks like a hungry beast who hasn't had a meal in forever, so his wife asks him what he's waiting for. She says that there is no need for any kind of reservation, and they should unleash all their desires into this passionate night. What follows is a vast variety of unspeakable acts that lead to one big explosion. Once they are done, Aura takes a moment to calm down and asks her husband to forgive her for losing control. She asks if they are done with the deed, and Yama says yes, after which he asks how it was for her. The queen explains that whether it was in politics or on the battlefield, she has always been able to make her way through the blood baths that were in front of her. However, tonight was the first ever instance where she had considered surrendering herself to anyone. Yama does not know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, so he says sorry. Of course, Aura says that there is no need to apologize, as this is also one of her duties as a wife. Now, Aura tells her husband that they need to get some sleep because they have an early morning the next day. Our hero recalls that he and his wife have a parade at the capital tomorrow so he needs to be ready for that. He still has a lot to learn when it comes to the manners of this world, so he decides to get some sleep, but then he remembers something else. He gets out of bed in a hurry and leaves the room, so Aura wants to know what's going on. Our hero tells her that he has to give her something, and he will be back in a moment. Of course, Aura is still confused by what just happened, but then Yama enters the room with a small box. The queen asks him what this may be, and that's when our hero opens the box to reveal a burst of light. It turns out to be the wedding rings that Yama had bought for himself and Aura back when he was in Japan. He then tells her that it is one of his world's wedding customs where the man and the woman both put a ring on each other's left ring fingers and swear their eternal love for each other. Now, Yama bends the knee and asks Aura to give him her left hand, to which she complies. Our hero then puts on the ring and makes his vows to his new wife with an eternal promise. The queen is taken aback by such a gesture, so she blushes in front of Yama, 
and then he asks her if she could do the same thing for him as well. The queen finishes her vows and her oath as well, which means that she and Yama are both officially married as per their world's customs. Aura feels that wedding rings, vows and oaths are very interesting, so if word of this were to spread across her kingdom, then they might become a part of this world's customs as well. Yama says that if this would be the case, then they are the first ever couple to exchange rings in this world. Aura agrees that it would be amusing in its own right, and then the couple goes to sleep. Some time passes by, and we can see our hero's alarm going off at half past five in the morning. He wakes up on time and tells us that it has been ten days since he first acted on his intrusive thoughts with Aura. Since then, he has been able to settle into this world just about all right, and he looks at his wife smiling at him in bed. It turns out that this is quite an early time for a normal person in Japan to wake up. But in this kingdom, it is actually considered to be late. That's because this is a culture where there is no real source of light other than fire. Because of that, people take the sun rising to be precious as they want to make the most out of the light. Of course, since he does not have any work to do of his own, he does not have the need to wake up any earlier than he does. Now we see Aura getting ready for work, and that's when Yama says that the only reason he does wake up at this time is because he wants to spend time with his wife before she goes out to fulfill her duties as the queen. He asks her what her day looks like today because he wants to eat together with her. The queen comments that she does not know if she will be able to make it back to the inner palace either for breakfast or for lunch. However, if all goes well, then she could be here for dinner. But she also states that if Yama really wants to eat with her, then he could simply come to the main palace, as that would be easier for everyone. The problem for Yama is that if he goes to this section, then there is a high chance of him running into a noble who is not Aura. If he ends up saying something odd due to his lack of social manners in this world, then it may cause trouble to his wife. On top of that, he worries about saying something which could come off in a way that he is making fun of Aura. If this would be the case, then the queen would end up facing a lot of criticism from the common folk of her own kingdom. Keeping this in mind, our hero tells his wife that going to the main palace would only cause trouble for everyone. So he would much rather just stay here and laze about. He knows that he might be overthinking, but one can never be too safe in an unknown world so he would much rather not take any risks at all. Aura sees sense in what he's saying, so the couple kisses each other goodbye for the day while the queen promises to be back for dinner. With that, Aura leaves the room and Yama is left alone with himself and his gadgets. Our hero lazes around in bed and wonders what he should do now. He used to be busy all the time back in Japan, and even now, he did have a few basic tasks to complete but now is the start of his lazy time. Yama remembers that he had recorded a lot of movies on his DVDs, but never got a chance to watch any of them. He also has a lot of games which he wants to play, but has never opened, and on top of that, he has a lot of bands that he really wants to listen to, but could never do so due to his busy schedule in Japan. He decides to kick things off by watching a TV show that he had recorded, and he wonders how much time it will take for him to finish all of it. He also wonders how long it will take for him to exhaust all his entertainment material. And then we shift to Aura, who is busy signing some papers. With her is her right-hand man Fadio, who tells her that it's just about time for her to speak with the next person. She asks who is waiting to talk to her now, and Fadio says that it's the captain of the knights, known as General Pion. Aura knows this name because Pion is like a hero in this kingdom, and he was also a candidate who wanted to marry her. She wonders what he is here for because he is a man who is full of ambition. It could be that he simply wants to congratulate her for her wedding, but she can't be sure of it. Fadio says that knights at the rank of general have the right to request an audience with the queen, so she agrees to let him in. Pion enters the scene and we can see that he has scars on his face, probably from past battles. He starts off by saying he would like to offer his regards once again, so he personally congratulates Aura on her wedding. She thanks him for his kind words, and even addresses the elephant in the room by saying 
even though they did not exchange marriage vows with each other, she still hopes to have a good relationship with him as his ruler. Payan is glad to hear that, and he mentions that ever since the wedding got done with, the capital city has been bustling with activities. It could even be said that the kingdom of Capua has entered a new age. Of course, Aura does not have the time for small talk, so she asks Payan to get to the point. The night boy says that he knows Aura is aware of his sister, who is a lot younger than him. This sister also has shallow blood bond to the royal family, just like he does, and it means that she does technically have royal blood running through her veins. Payan adds that his sister has magical powers, a good personality, and has also been educated well, so she will not be an embarrassment to anyone. All of this is fine, but Aura wants to know what Payan's sister has to do with her. The night boy gives a shady smile and asks the queen how she would feel about introducing his sister to Yama and making her his concubine. He wants to do this in order to strengthen the royal bloodline, but Aura clearly does not look happy about this. Aura says that the matter does sound interesting, but she wants to know what Payan's sister has to say on the matter. The night boy is confused by this question because he is the head of his family, so he feels that his sister's opinion does not matter. Aura understands what's going on, so she says that Yama has only just come to this world, so his mind and body are still not used to living here yet. As a matter of fact, his hands seem to be full just dealing with her as of now. Of course, this is not what Payan wanted to hear, but he controls his feelings and then asks the queen if this is indeed what her husband has said. Aura says yes, and then she asks him if he is doubting his words. The night boy figures out the game she is playing, but he can't say anything, so he agrees with Aura and says sorry for being rude. He still states that his desire to meet Yama is purely genuine because he wants to see how his new master and lord is. He asks Aura to say these exact same words to her husband, and she agrees to do it, but not before sighing out of frustration. With that, Payan takes his leave and gets out of the room, but Aura states that he is being a bit too ambitious. After all, his own marriage failed with her, and now he is trying to use his own little sister just to get his hands on the royal throne in some way or the other. His ambition is very clear and obvious, almost in a way that one may call it refreshing. Fadio then says that many others will also come to her with such proposals. The problem though, is that Aura can't keep saying no to these people as it may cause problems moving forward. It could so happen that people will start spreading rumors about Aura locking up her husband and not giving him any freedom so that she can control all the power of the kingdom. Of course, Aura knows that Yama has chosen to stay inside the inner palace out of his own free will because he does not want to meet too many people from this world. However, the queen is sure that no one will believe her if she gives them this story. Even so, the consensus is that Yama will be needed to leave the inner palace, so that the public can see what they are like as a couple. Aura takes a moment to review this, and then she asks Fadio how long will it take before the nobles become impatient to meet her husband. He says that it could be anywhere between a month and a month and a half, so she decides to make the most out of this time. Aura will now hire a tutor to teach Yama about the customs and rules of her world, especially with regards to magic. She gets Fadio to work on this as soon as possible, and later she asks him on the update. He says that there are three candidates who have recommended themselves, and another 31 candidates who have been sent from others. However, from the looks of it, these people are probably just trying to become Yama's shady slave girls, as they are all unmarried. Aura laments that the people of this town really do take her for a fool, but then Fadio tells her that there is one person who can't be ignored. She happens to be the wife of Count Margus, known as Octavia, and she is the model woman of what a noble is supposed to be. Whether it's knowledge, education, or even skills in magical arts, she seems to have it all. Despite this, Aura is not too impressed because she thinks that Count Marges may want his own wife to do shady things with her own husband. Fadio says that the Count would probably not go so far as to turn his own wife into a night lady. He does have some kind of idea though, which is that the Count may want Octavia to drag Yama out from under Aura's nose. She is very pretty, 
so if she praises Yama and looks at him with respect, then he might want to get into politics soon enough. If he were to do such a thing, then people like Margaz will be able to have a connect with a royal ruler. This gives Aura a lot to think about, as she knows that the Count is a shady man with an evil mind. He is clearly the one to worry about between him and his wife as Octavia should not have any kind of ill intent. There's also the fact that Aura can't keep rejecting people, so she needs to do something about Octavia. Fadio asks her if they should go ahead with the Count's wife, or should they just reject her with some reason. From the looks of it, Aura approves Octavia, and then she has a hot tub bath with her lover boy. She tells Yama that she will have him make his public debut in exactly one month from now. This naturally comes as a shock to our hero, but Aura asks him to attend a reception party that will happen in the royal palace. This is not good news for Yama, so he sulks inside the water. But he knew that a queen's husband would not be able to stay under the radar for long. He also believes that he should do this for his sweet curvy wife, so he agrees to give it his best shot. Aura says sorry to him because she knew that she had promised not to involve him in any kind of work. Yama seems to be fine with this, so he asks what his tutor is going to be like. The queen simply says that she will be someone who is worthy of trust, but the look on her face makes Yama suspect something. Anyway, she stands up to give her husband a full frontal view, and then she declares that she will teach Yama the basic manners of her land before he gets to meet the tutor. Our hero is obviously distracted by his wife's body, but he's also unsure if he'll be able to learn so much in so little time. He hasn't studied in years, so he wonders if there's a way to learn faster and better. That's when an idea strikes him, so Aura wants to know what it is, but he says that they will need to get out of the bathtub first before checking it out. Soon enough, the couple gets done with their bath, and Yama brings out his digital camera. Aura doesn't know what this is supposed to be, so she refers to it as a box. That's when our hero explains this camera is used for taking still images and also to record audio and video. Basically, he can use these recordings for his lessons, but his wife still has no idea what a picture or a video is. Yama doesn't know how he can explain this, so he says that he will show Aura how this camera works while she teaches him manners. The queen kicks things off by saying that royal people don't usually engage with people of a higher rank than them on public occasions. So the first thing that needs to be taught to Yama is how to behave with people from a lower rank. She starts talking about how he should address such people first. And after some time, our hero has taken enough footage to learn the first set of lessons. Now, he wants to check and see if the video turned out okay. But Aura doesn't get this either. She also decides to have a look at what Yama is doing, as her lover boy attaches the camera to his laptop, which is also a device from another world to her. Yama clicks on the video file, and we can see Aura speaking on the laptop screen, which shocks her to her core. She can't believe that she is seeing herself say the exact same words that she was using earlier. She also admits that she has never seen anything like this in her life, not even in the Twin Kingdoms. However, there is a problem for Yama, as he can see his wife speaking, but he can't understand a single word of what she's saying. Aura is speaking in some kind of foreign language that he has never even heard of before, and that's when we learn about the soul of words. It's a magical power that only a certain number of people have, which allows them to perceive the same word, even if it is across multiple languages. Since Yama also has a small amount of magic, he was able to talk to the people of this world. His digital camera though, does not have such magic. So even if he records the sound, he will not be able to record the magic translation. It's this very magic that serves to be the main difference between Earth and this world. The worst part is that because he was able to speak to Aura with ease, he did not even bother to learn the language of this kingdom by himself. It turns out that the language here is not as easy as he would have liked it to be, because the characters and symbols differ even between each region. Luckily for our hero, Aura comes up with a way for him to learn the letters with ease, and then she hands over the notes to Yama. She is also impressed by the fact that the pen she is using does not need her to dip it into ink. 
Yama tells her that it's called a ballpoint pen, and he can give her a couple of them if she wants. The queen instantly says yes, because it would be very convenient for her daily tasks. Now that they're at it, Yama wants to learn about the numbers of this world too, but Aura says that it would be tough for him to do this. Anyway, she begins with the numbers from 1 till 10, and then she tells Yama to focus on getting these right. The funny thing is that these numbers are written in words, and not in actual numerical form. So our hero wonders if this world does not even have the concept of numerical values. In Yama's opinion, this can't be true because he knows that before Arabian numerals were taught in Japan, they used to employ the Chinese method of doing things. Now, he tells his wife that the way to learn numbers is actually very easy, and he proceeds to show her how numerical values work on Earth. Aura can't believe what she's seeing because the Arabic numerals are far too easy to learn. Yama goes on to say that if Aura would want to balance the amount of money coming in and going out of her kingdom, then Arabic numbers would be the way to go. The queen agrees with her husband, but she states that she hasn't done much for him and is only taking benefits from the items that he has brought from Earth. Aura has not returned the favor, even though she has had a very pleasant time with our hero ever since he reincarnated into her world. Yama tells her it's fine because he wanted to use these devices anyway. On top of that, our hero has also come prepared to do the work of a royal noble. This is because the work is still nothing if he were to compare how hard his life was as a salary man. Despite his words, Aura still asks Yama if he is having any problems over here. He is confused to hear this, so the queen says that she does understand. He tries to avoid people over here because of how it may affect her own position. If she is being honest, then it has helped her a lot, and even the staff assigned to Yama, such as the maids and the cooks, have only nice things to say about him. Keeping this in mind, the queen wants to repay her husband for all the things he has done for her so far. Of course, she does not want him to be selfish, but he can ask her for whatever he wants. Yama does not really have much to complain about, but since Aura wants to pay him back so much, then he decides to awaken his intrusive thoughts. He makes a shady face and fake attacks Aura by telling his wife that he wants her to pay him with her body. Since the queen is experienced in combat, she stops our hero in his tracks, but then offers her body as payment. This doesn't help Yama's ego as he turns away and looks down in shame. Aura does not know what's going on, so she asks her husband if he is unwell. He then says that he may not have gone all out, but he was hoping to push Aura down on the sofa to have his way with her, and yet she caught him so easily. Basically, it's his pride as a man that has taken a beating here, so the queen realizes that she has hurt his feelings. Aura comes up with an idea, and then she pretends to fall on the couch, but this hilarious display doesn't do the trick for Yama. He knows he didn't use any kind of special tackle with a time lag or anything like that, so there's no appeal to it. Aura doesn't know what else to do, so she keeps falling down on the couch again and again. Yama tells her such a trick is not going to work on him, so the queen falls down once more and shows off her assets in the process. Seeing her curvy body is all it takes for our hero's intrusive thoughts to return once again, and he attacks her in full beast mode which even she can't fight back. A few days pass by, and now we see Yama on his laptop with Aura behind him. She had asked our hero to do the kingdom's taxes from the previous year, after he had learned the letters of the language. It wasn't much, but there were terms like places, names and values, so these were the best options for Yama to try and execute the knowledge he has just learned. Once our hero gets done with the taxes, he inputs the language from there and into his laptop, which he can then use to study. Of course, he is not perfect at this yet, because he is still making a few spelling errors, but that's fine because he has only just started. Yama is using Excel sheets for the taxes, so Aura gets confused when she sees that some of the boxes have the numbers in red, while the others have the numbers in blue. She wishes to know if there is some kind of meaning behind these colors. So Yama explains to her that he has made the Excel sheet do the calculations for each person after he put in the numbers. 
The people who have paid less than what they were supposed to are marked in red, while the ones who have paid more taxes than their due amounts have their numbers marked in blue. Aura is shocked to see this, but Yama tells her that he figured it would be easy to calculate the taxes as long as he had the data. Aura takes the sheets with the taxes on them and asks her husband if she can borrow them for a bit. He has no problem with this, but he states that his wife should go easy on the ones who did not pay their taxes. It's not his place to say this, but either way, Aura knows what needs to be done. Now, the queen hands over these files to Fadio, so he wants to know what this is all about. She says that these are the tax documents of all the nobles from the previous year. This is when we learn that Aura had Yama look at these files over the pretext of learning letters, but her actual aim was to test his skills to see if he could understand government affairs. However, she did not expect Yama to calculate them perfectly and even notice errors just over the course of a few days. Fadio is shocked to see this, so Aura comments that he will always be wary of her husband. Even so, Fadio says that he does not see Yama wanting to take part in the politics of this world. What he admits though, is that he never thought Aura would find a man as proper and convenient as him. After all, it's not easy to find a man who would willingly go out of his way to make sure the queen's reputation would not be diminished. This puts the queen into some deep thoughts, but Fadio tells her that she should not be the one to doubt her own husband. Instead, he will keep an eye on Yama to see if there's anything suspicious with our hero. Aura agrees with him and apologizes for troubling him with so much work. Fadio simply goes along with this and says that it has indeed been nothing but trouble ever since he became the queen's secretary. Aura does not say anything to this because she knows she is guilty, but she shifts to the real matter at hand, which is to penalize all the nobles for not paying their taxes on time or as per the correct amount. There are quite a few names who have messed up on a massive scale, so the queen does not want to spare them at all. However, Fadio tells her that it has become a normal practice to ignore crimes such as these, no matter how bad they may be. After all, if Aura gets too rough with them, then it may lead to a revolt. She knows this, so she figures that they can just use these files as dirt on the nobles, which they can use to reach a compromise when needed. Fadio adds that all the men she has mentioned are the ones who had done a lot during the previous war. Aura knows this, but that's the reason why it's even more of a problem for her. Of course, friction between the royal palace and the lords could not be avoided, and even though Aura knows that she should control herself and not damage anyone's honor or prestige, what is illegal is still illegal, so she will make sure to have the nobles pay some kind of penalty for this. Fadio does not want the queen to make a rash decision, so he offers a solution wherein he will inform the nobles about the discrepancies in their numbers. This will allow him to ask the nobles to cooperate, as per their own discretion, so as not to cause such an issue again. This does seem fair to Aura, so she leaves it all to Fadio, as he knows best how to deal with this situation. Now we move back to our hero Yama, as he waits for his tutor to show up. The party is only a month away from today, so he needs to do his best for Aura, no matter what. Now, he remembers what was taught to him about not speaking to a lower class person before they first speak to him. However, he also has to take care not to say anything rude, so he is caught in an odd place where he has no idea how to speak to his own tutor. Soon enough, Octavia is brought to the scene, so our hero is asked if he would like her to enter. Yama tries to activate alpha mode as he makes a straight face and allows Octavia to come in. She walks into the room and says it's a pleasure to meet Yama, after which she gives her own introduction to him. Needless to say, she is very pretty and also has proper manners as she bows down to our hero and says that she will do her best to teach him the ways of her kingdom. Octavia also says that she is not very literate or experienced so she will try to live up to our hero's expectations. Of course, Yama finds it hard to believe such a thing, because he knows that such a woman is a hard find. Modesty must be a virtue here, as our hero now realizes what Aura had meant when she said that Octavia is a model lady. Now, Yama examines Octavia's body and notices that her hair is straight and black, 
which makes it shine in the light. On top of that, her skin is so pale that he would not even believe that she is from here. Of course, this is not the time to get caught up in her looks, so Yama puts his intrusive thoughts to rest and raises his head. Now he gives an intro of his own and states that he wants their acquaintance to be on good terms, no matter how long it may last. Octavia simply says that Yama is honoring her with his words, so he has her sit down. He wants to know what she will be teaching him today, but she is actually taken aback by his request to have her sit down. Anyway, Octavia says that she will teach Yama about the history of this kingdom of Capua as well as magic. Of course, this needs to be done a bit at a time, and our hero also needs to learn about the attitude, manners and basic knowledge of Capua. Octavia says that manner and knowledge can't be learned by word of mouth, so she will need to show him how it's done. In order to do this, she will be having lunch with Yama from now on, because both manners and basic knowledge come in handy at the dining table. Our hero gets why she's saying this, but he becomes a bit nervous because he doesn't want his tutor to watch him eat. Anyway, he approves of this method and will review how good it actually is. Now, Octavia starts her lesson by reminding Yama about how he got up to greet her when she entered the room. He becomes conscious because even though Octavia felt honored by his gesture, he should not stand up to greet someone who is of a lower class. If he does so, then the other person will think poorly of him. On top of that, he had also asked her to sit down, even while he was standing, which is a kindness way too grand for someone like her. Yama has no idea why he needs to learn these things, but Octavia states that it's important for him as a royal to behave in a subtler way. He understands what she means, but it will be hard for our hero to do this, because he is still stuck up in the ways he would be submissive to his boss's back when he was a salary man. He keeps telling himself that he is royalty, and then Octavia proceeds to teach him some magic. Yama is too kind again when he says please, so Octavia has to correct him once again. She kicks things off with the basics of magic, which begins with the fact that there are two types of magic. One type is the magic of the four elements that almost anyone can use, and the other type is bloodline magic, which only people from a specific bloodline can use. Yama figures that the normal magic has to do with elements like fire, water, earth, and wind, while bloodline magic is like the space-time spell that Aura had cast to get him here. However, Octavia maintains that the main difference between bloodline magic and elemental magic is the fact that only certain people can use the former. In order to use magic, there are three basic rules that must always be met. There has to be correct intonation, correct perception, and also a correct amount of mana. Yama is a bit puzzled, so Octavia says that magic has its own kind of language. If a person can't use the magic language, then they will not be able to use any magic at all. She has to show this, so she chants a spell with the right kind of focus, and then Yama sees an orb forming around her finger. He can't believe this, because it felt like she had chanted a long spell, whereas she didn't really talk that much. Octavia can see how shocked Yama is, so she drops the sphere which was basically a bubble of the tea she was drinking. She then explains that the magic language can vary even with the slightest variation. On the other hand, she can also compress a lot of information in short sounds. Octavia also explains that anyone who hears this sound for the first time will feel some kind of discomfort, so she says sorry to Yama. He wants to tell her that he's fine, but then he remembers that he needs to act with authority, so he allows her to continue with her lesson. Octavia is honored by this, so she continues to teach our hero by explaining how she was able to make a water ball. This was simply by making use of the three basic magic rules, and now she will show Yama what happens if she does it incorrectly. She goes on to show various examples of making a mistake while chanting a spell. And Yama is amazed to see that even a small change can make the spell useless. As a matter of fact, even using too much mana in a spell is not a good thing, and the magic will still not work. Octavia explains that using a lot of mana for spells that require it makes sense, but this does not work for smaller spells because they need the exact amount of mana, 
This is why people with a lot of mana tend to dislike lesser spells and only focus on higher level ones. Yama is glad to hear this, and he is looking forward to using magic himself. But then he realizes that since he has a large amount of mana, he will not be able to use basic magic. Octavia says he's right and states that even Aura has this problem due to her royal blood. Apart from space-time magic, she can only use one other spell, which is an ultimate fire blast finisher move. The worst part is that such an intonation is so long that it would take a few months of precise intonation for Aura to use the fire blast. All of this is starting to make sense to our hero, but now he wants the truth from Octavia, so he asks her how long it's going to take him to learn magic. She becomes a bit reserved upon hearing this, so she says that it will be necessary for her to spend some time with him in order to figure how much mana he really has. Keeping this in mind, she feels it will take two years for Yama to figure how much mana he has, and another one year for him to be able to manipulate that mana. Yama makes a serious face because three years is a lot of time, but Octavia panics upon seeing his face, so she says that the rest of it should be easy as long as the three basic rules are kept in mind. As a matter of fact, our hero will be able to learn a simple spell within just one day after he figures out his mana. Of course, it's not like Yama is upset, so he tells Octavia that they can take their time and there is no need to rush. He tells her to instruct him well, and she also says that he is in good hands. Yama knows that he is not in any rush to learn magic either, because he just wanted a bonus lesson on top of the manners that he had learned. In the night, he meets with Aura who asks him how his first lesson went. He doesn't know how else to say it, so he confesses that it was a lot more tiring than he had thought it would be. Octavia had to keep calling him out on his manners to the point where he couldn't even recall what he had eaten. Aura apologizes to her husband for making him go through such a hardship, but he is fine with it because he has to learn it some day or the other. Plus, he likes to hear Octavia talk about magic because she does it in an interesting way. He also admits to being a bit upset upon learning it would take him three years to master magic. Yama wonders if there is any shortcut to learning such magic, but Aura says that's just the way things are in this world. Now, the queen gets cozy with her husband and asks him what he thought about Octavia. She wants to know if the tutor girl was able to awaken his intrusive thoughts, so it puts Yama in a spot. However, he decides to answer honestly and says that Octavia was indeed very pretty and seemed like a nice person as well. He wouldn't be surprised if a girl like his tutor would be popular, so this makes Aura a bit conscious. She asks her husband if he wants to do shady things to Octavia as well. So Yama loses all sense of thinking and compares getting freaky with the tutor girl to a game of baseball. As expected, none of his words are cohesive and Aura is left to wonder what he's trying to say but she also lets out a small chuckle upon seeing our hero's reaction. She then asks Yama to tell her what he wants to say in simple language, so he decides to activate flirt mode. He says that if Octavia was the one who summoned him here instead of Aura, then he would not have chosen to stay. He is pleased with the way he was able to handle this, and the look on Aura's face also suggests that she is happy with his answer. The queen says that even she would not have been as happy and satisfied if she had summoned someone other than our hero, and then the couple acts on their shady intentions. Later in the night, we can see that Yama is fast asleep, but Aura is still awake. She decides to get out of the bed, and then she sneakily exits the room for some work. Now, the queen gets dressed and sits on the couch, after which she summons one of the maid girls to report to her. She wants to know if Octavia acted shady in any way, and the maid girl says this was not the case at all. This makes Aura wonder if the tutor girl is actually here for reconnaissance, so she tells the maid girl to report to her only if she sees something suspicious from Octavia. The queen also asks her maid if her husband has been acting any differently than he usually does. She also wants to know if Yama is trying to get shady with any of the maid girls, but learns that he does not have any interest in any other girl. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even bother looking at other women as he's happy playing video games and watching movies. 
He seems to hate it when the maid girls enter his room. So even they make it a point to only come in when there is a task that they have to attend to. Aura realizes that Yama is not very good at asserting himself because he sees making requests as a vice. She then tells the maid girl that even though it will be difficult, she and the other maids must try to figure what Yama likes and they should make sure to meet his demands. With that, the maid girl is told to leave and Aura is left alone with her thoughts on the couch. She is now sure that her husband does not see Octavia as a shady partner either, and this seems to do something to her. She pours herself a drink, but also feels some excitement building up inside her. This is very different from doing well in her government work or drinking a victory toast, and we realize that it's love. Aura could never imagine being loved by a boy like Yama would make her feel so special, and she also wants to keep him only to herself. Now we shift to Octavia who has come back to her husband's palace. She is greeted by her butler Sirio and asks for her husband. Sirio tells her that he's in his usual spot on the second floor, so she goes to meet him, and we finally see Count Margus looking at his wife with shady intentions. However, these intentions may not have to do with her body, but rather the kingdom of Capua. The Count says sorry to his wife for having pushed such a request onto her at the very last moment, but she smiles and says that she's actually thankful to have been given the opportunity to teach someone so respectable. Margus figures this is how his wife has always been, so he asks her how Yama is as a person. This is when he learns that the queen's husband is a calm and unambitious kind of guy. Of course he is very kind as well and Octavia states that he has a very strong desire for learning. This gets the count thinking, so he asks his wife who she would assign to Yama as a concubine if she were to choose. This takes her by surprise, but then she smiles again and tells her husband to stop plotting whatever he has in his head. He wants to know why his own wife would say such a thing. So she says that even though she has only met Yama and Aura a few times, it is exactly how the maids have told her. The two of them are very close and seem to have an intimate kind of relationship that goes beyond making babies. Octavia feels that even if a concubine were to enter the inner palace, she would only feel out of place. This is news to Marguez because he could never imagine any man loving Aura as much as Yama does. He goes on to tell Octavia that unlike she, who was born as a literal goddess and every man's ideal woman, he finds it hard to call Aura attractive. He seems to have questionable taste, and then he confirms with his wife if Yama indeed loves Aura as much as she is claiming him to. Octavia repeats herself once more and says that Yama does not have any ambition or thirst for power, so the only reason for him to leave his own world and come here would be for Aura's love. Marges understands the assignment and says that it would be best for them to support the royal couple rather than send in a concubine. Octavia fully agrees with the Count, but of course, this is a calculated decision and not an emotional one. He knows that he does not have any pawn who looks like Aura, so it would be pointless to send a concubine to seduce Yama. Also, his family already boasts a great amount of power right now, so it does not make sense to risk it all over something like this. As of now, he can only wait for an opportunity to present itself to him so he will stand by and support Aura's relationship till that happens. However, he still can't understand Yama's taste in women, probably because no other girl in the entire kingdom is as assertive as the queen. We now see Aura in action on the training field with General Payan. They are assessing some of the candidates in the new regiment, and they seem to train very well as even their mounts are silent. It's time to begin the show. So Pion is told to make his men start their training exercises. What follows is a rather impressive display as the soldiers do their best to land an impression on the general and the queen. Aura tells Pion that he has done an amazing job in training these soldiers because they are all extremely skilled. He adds that around 80% of the men here are fit to join Aura's army, and at this rate, she will have her desired army soon. The queen notes that these men are swift, and also strong in spirit. So Payan says that these dragon-back archery knights are the very backbone of this country's army. However, they were also the same ones who bore the greatest brunt of the damage from the last war. 
It takes a lot of time and effort to replenish such soldiers, but Payan has gone ahead and gotten 80% of the job done already. The general tells his queen that she should not be praising him, but rather the breeders of the dragons as they are the ones who deserve the credit. Aura agrees with this because the life of a raptor dragon is only about 50 years and a great deal of them were ended during the previous war. It would have taken a lot of food and effort to nurse them back to health, even when they were on the brink of passing away. Seeing this pleases the queen, so she tells Pion that she will increase the military budget, but not by much as she has limited funds. Even so, she would want the general to use this budget in the best possible way. Once this is done, he will compile a list of military demands and present it for approval. Of course, this is only possible because of our hero Yama's genius when it comes to tax fraud. Aura was able to get the defaulting nobles to pay their dues, which is why she has the money to increase the budget. Hyun says that it will not take him long to create the report because a lot of military hydra-ups will be in the capital's banquet in a couple of days. This gets Aura's attention because she can see the contrast between Pion and her husband. Now that he has her attention, the general says that his sister will also be present at the banquet, so it would be great if she could spend some time with Yama while she's there. Aura does not want to give anything away, so she just promises to relay his words to her husband. Now we move forward to the night of the banquet, where there are a lot of people in attendance. Since this world does not have electricity, it actually takes a lot of money to host a party like this. Instead of glass, the chandeliers are made of silver and crystals of the highest quality. Even the carpets are crafted by the masters of the industry, and the tall tables are made from a single tree. Add the lavish feast on display, and we have the perfect banquet for the upper-class people of this kingdom to enjoy. Of course, this is also the chance for the royal family to show off their wealth and power on a periodical basis. It's time for our hero to get acquainted with people, so Aura starts off by making him meet Baron Pantoja, who was a knight commander in the previous war, but now serves as a feudal lord. The Baron greets Yama and says that his actual name is Thomas, so they have a friendly start to the banquet. Time passes by, and all seems to be well, but our hero is clearly having a hard time, because he did not imagine that politics would be this exhausting. A royal's job is to maintain the correct posture, smile at everyone, and use the right words at all times. The worst part is that he needs to remember the names of all the people he is meeting, but that seems highly unlikely. It's times like this where he recalls his time as a salary man, where taking business cards would be the best way to keep a track of all the people he's meeting. With no other choice, our hero decides to memorize people based on their character traits, such as a bald middle-aged man with a flower shirt. Then there's the purple seal granny and many other people, so our hero is clearly having a hard time, which Aura notices. She gives him a drink and says how she has placed such a huge burden on him, but she would like him to make it through this somehow. The queen also mentions that at this banquet, the only real skill he needs to show is dancing. He does not need to pay strict attention to rank as he would during a public event, so it's the perfect place for his debut. Yama calms down after having his drink and tells his wife that he will take his time to get to know all the people over here little by little. In the middle of all this, Count Marges and Octavia also show up to greet the royal couple. Seeing them together makes Yama wonder how on earth someone like Octavia would get married to a man like the Count. They look like father and daughter at this point. But our hero knows it would be great to have a second wife as pretty as Octavia. Now, Aura holds his arm tightly, which is a signal to let him know that this person is important, so he should do his best to remember his name as well as his face. Both Marges and Octavia bow down to the couple and thank them for the invites. Yama goes on to say how Octavia has been helping him as a tutor, and Marges tries to act humble, but Aura tells him his skills are very much appreciated. Everyone watches on as the royal couple chats with the Count and his wife, so things seem to be going well for now. However, is that all there is to this party? Will our hero be showered with more offers to take in shady lovers? Like share, and subscribe if you like this video.
Hit the bell icon to get notified when I upload part 3. See you soon.